Hi everyone, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. I'm your host of Yoga Birth Babies. And today we have one of my favorite type of podcasts. It is a community birth story. So I have Jessica Roback. She is part of our community. She did her teacher training last year, her prenatal yoga teacher training while pregnant. So it was really joyous to get to see her move through her pregnancy during the training. I love when we have pregnant students in the training because not only do I get to know them and watch them go through the process, but we get to hear their feedback as a pregnant body, as a pregnant person, moving through the practice and learning about themselves and sharing that with the other members of the teacher training. So I got to know Jessica through that. And then because we have our classes online, I got to see her throughout the end of her pregnancy because she kept taking classes. So it's wonderful when after her after she gave birth, she shared a little bit about her story. And I was just so excited to hear how positive it was and really what a wonderful experience she had that I asked her, would she want to share on the podcast? And she said, yes. So I'm so excited for you to hear about her story. Let me tell you a little bit about what you're going to hear about. So as I learned from Jessica being in the teacher training, she is methodical. She is thoughtful. She really puts a lot of effort into what she's focused on. And she took the same thing that she did with the training to her birth. So she shares a lot about how she prepared for her pregnancy and her births. She talked a lot about how she chose her care team the midwives she worked with and the doulas. And of course she opened up about her birth and what did she call it? I think she called it very quick and very peaceful. So you'll hear really a lovely story and how Jessica worked through some challenging moments and the mantras that she used to get her to the other side of that. And one of the reasons that I get so excited to share these birth stories is something that Jessica actually mentioned in the conversation. When she was sharing that, when she shared her birth vision with folks, is that sometimes their own perspective of birth seeped out and she was met sometimes with negativity. So one of the reasons I think it's so important to share these positive birth stories is because if we only have the impression of birth, maybe from families or friends or media or just conjuring it up what you think birth might look like, then we're not giving ourselves the opportunity to hear the full spectrum, all the different ways that birth can unfold. Now, people, that's not saying that just by hearing positive birth stories, your birth is going to unfold that same way, but it may change if we can hear positive happy, beautiful experiences that we can recognize birth can unfold in so many ways, not just the ways that maybe family or friends shared, but there are a lot of opportunity for being empowered and excited about it. So I'm really excited for you to hear Jessica's story. Before we get to that, I always love to give studio updates. So we are on the brink of starting our early fall teacher training. That's online. And then we've got our late fall then winter, those three are online. And then in person in New York City, if you want to take a trip to New York, perfect excuse, come take a prenatal yoga teacher training in the spring. And then of course we finish off with an online postnatal teacher training. So I'm really excited to start working with this new cohort of prenatal yoga teacher trainees. We're also back in the swing of things at PYC. I had a few vacations during that time. Um, So I've been out of the studio for a little bit, but I'm really excited to be back in. And we have a few schedule changes. So the schedule looks the same, but some of the teachers are are swapping spots. It's like a big cast that I have to work around and a big puzzle. And I'm excited about this new fall schedule of teachers. So I think those that take class will also be excited about that. And of course, our workshops are happening and we have a new workshop with Ellen Gary um, happening in September that will continue. So, so much happening at PYC. Check it all out on our website. Last thing I always want to do is take a big thank you to the community and then ask you when you you have a moment to please leave a rating and review. It helps people find us. All right. That is enough of me. We're going to take a super quick break. When we come back, please enjoy Jessica's birth story. 
Hi, Jessica. How are you? Hi, Deb. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing really great. I'm so excited to hear your birth story because I loved seeing you go through your pregnancy during teacher training. So to be able to hear how everything went is it's really exciting. So I appreciate you being open and sharing. Absolutely. How have things been? How's things been on the home front with two kids? Good, good. Um, it's definitely a transition. Even though you like know what you're going through with the first, the second, and any subsequent children, I'm sure <laughs> still rock your world. So um, yeah, controlled chaos, but taking it day by day and it's all going well. Oh, I'm really excited. I'm excited to hear the story. So before we get into talking about your birth and prepping for that, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Yeah. So I live in the Chicago suburbs. Um, yoga is kind of how I found the podcast and found your training. Um, so I've been teaching since 2019 and practicing for a few years before that. And I'm just kind of a Midwest girl. Grew up in Indiana, um, met my husband when we were studying at Purdue. So we've been together for 12 years this fall, which is kind of crazy. And yeah, now we're just uh, living the suburb life with our two kids and our cat. Um, still trying to travel and enjoy the outdoors when we can. Uh, really love sharing that with with our family. And yeah, like I said, just taking it day by day, but uh, really enjoying the whole family life that we've built. Oh, I love that. My husband is from the Chicago area, so I've been out there a bunch. It is very oh, yeah. nice. It's very different. I grew up in the Northeast and I've spent, I realize now, more than half my life in the New York area and in Manhattan. And it's a very different vibe. I think I'm just, I mean, I'm from the Boston area and then New York. So I think I'm used to a little bit pushier. And I'm going to say that with love um, because this is where I live. And then going out to the Midwest, people are so nice. And it took yeah. me by surprise. I'm like, Oh, are you talking to me? You're at, you're generally asking how I'm doing. Okay. Cause I'm so used to walking around New York and like what I call my cone of silence. I've got my headphones in. I'm just like mm -hmm. cruising through. So I've learned to really appreciate the Midwestern lifestyle. Yes. Midwest nice is a real thing. <laughs> yeah. It took me by surprise. All right. Let's jump into talking about your births and your pregnancies. So Knowing you throughout the teacher training, I got a sense of, you know, your personality and your focus and you're very focused. You did, I still remember you did amazingly well on your final exam. Um, so I know that you're meticulous and you're thoughtful. So how did that translate into preparing for your births? How, what did that look like? Yeah. Um, also very meticulous and methodical. It's kind of how I approach most things. Um, and honestly, my preparation for birth started even before we started trying to conceive. I really like to get my hands into research, no matter what I'm doing, um, be as prepared as possible, or just feel like I've done everything that I can to feel as prepared as possible. There's some things in life you just can't be fully prepared for. Right. Um, but for me, I really treated it like training for a marathon, which I've done two of them. And I went about training in the same way where I have my my books that I've read, I've got my my plan all mapped out. Um, I took a lot of natural birth classes because after doing a lot of reading and research, decided that I wanted to go that route with my birth um, for the first one. Also did a lot of listening to positive birth stories to support that and kind of just learn the gambit of what's out there in terms of experiences and learn from that. Um, but also there's a lot of like physical and emotional prep that I feel like I had to do both with both of my births, even though I'd been through it the first time, the second time around, you just have less time because you already have another kid to be worrying about and mm -hmm. working a full-time job. So doing meditation, journaling, doing hypnobirthing classes kind of on my own, um, making lists of mantras or affirmations that I wanted to pull out in my labor or ones that were helping me throughout pregnancy. There was a, a lot of times in, especially in the first trimester when, um, things are a little bit more uncertain or just early on, you're not getting as many like ultrasounds and checks. So I leaned a lot on mantra mantras and affirmations to kind of get my head right in the early stages. And then throughout up until the birth, um, and then prepping for postpartum as well. That was something that even though I did a lot of research and in the moments knowing like, okay, I'm feeling this way because I know my hormones are out of whack or I'm feeling this way because I haven't taken the time to eat or whatever it was that day, like knowing why I was feeling a certain way sometimes, um, 
still doesn't make it any easier or to get through, but doing as much prep for that as I could by making healthy meals, having a pelvic PT that I'd already engaged with. That's great. Just doing things like that and adding things to my Amazon cart before I went to birth. So depending on the type of birth I ended up having, I could just hit, um, you know, add to cart and everything I would need would be on my doorstep whenever I got home from the hospital. So I kind of like to, like I said, be very meticulous and um, methodical about all those things. Um, it honestly felt like a second job sometimes. What were some of the mantras that you resonated with? Um, during both of my pregnancies. So with my first one, I got COVID at six weeks. Um, oh, no. And it was a very stressful time. It was 2021. And one that um, I come back to again throughout was I'm healthy. My baby is healthy. My body is strong. Um, and anytime I felt my head spinning with the what ifs, I just came back to repeating that over and over in my head. And that always helped to like calm me down and bring me back to the present. What did you use any of them during labor? Yes. Yes. So I, one that worked a lot during labor was breath in baby out. Oh, um, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Cause that's what we want. Baby get out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I it, like, I remember, I don't know when it came to me at some point when I was pregnant and I was just like, that's exactly what I want. It's part visualization, part you know, mantra. Um, and then at the end, Part of my- directive to baby. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So that's one that I, I really loved. So I know that you, so you obviously put time in time, effort and research. So when you came to your conclusions about how you were hoping your birth would unfold, mm-hmm. how did that land with family and friends when you were sharing that? Cause I know when I, I had two home births and I remember telling people that was going to be my choice, more my family. I think everyone else kind of expected it. And they, it did not land well. Um, (laughs) I actually got articles sent to me about why I shouldn't do this. Like it was, there was like a protest. How did it, how did it land? And what were the reactions with your family and friends? Yeah, I got like a lot of negative feedback, especially the first time around. Again, since I hadn't gone through it and I didn't know what I was getting in for as much as I prepared, but I had people telling me that I was crazy um, for not wanting to get an epidural saying like, we live in modern times. Why wouldn't you use modern medicine? Um, Things like, oh, my friend said she wanted to go natural, but she was begging for the drugs by the time she got there. So I quickly learned like who I wanted to share more details with and had to come up with a, um, a reaction anytime I was met with something negative because people ask those questions like, which I just find interesting that they're like, well, are you going to get the epidural? Um, And if I said no, and I was met with, wow, that's amazing. Like if there's anyone that can do it, it's you, then I'd be more um, willing to share with them later on or kind of talk to them a little bit more about it because they were willing to actually like have a conversation, not just try and like scare me. Mm -hmm. Um, But I thought it was really interesting because a lot of people that told me like, oh, wait and see, were people that hadn't even had babies yet and hadn't even been through it themselves. So Hmm. I just was really frustrated by the negativity I was getting. Um, yeah, from, from men, but also again, just women that hadn't given birth yet. And like kind of thinking about it again, from like the marathon perspective, if you were to ever like share, um, that like, I'm going to run my first marathon, people don't say, Oh, we'll, we'll see how you feel at mile 18, or I bet you'll walk (laughs) off the course. Like you're not met with that negativity like you are with birth. So um, yeah, I find it really frustrating, but it, it allowed me to, yeah. It reminds me of that question that we had in the teacher training. And since I'm not the one writing the essays, you probably remember this better, but it's something about how did your family's birth stories influence your mm-hmm. vision of birth? So it's so interesting that you were being met with negativity by some people that have never even given birth. Mm-hmm. And it's like their lens was kind of shining on you, their lens of like, oh, it's awful, you know, not even giving you the place for, oh, wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. You know, I support you in that. Or even if they don't, like, who are they to say you should or shouldn't? Like, we're so about inclusivity, like including people's views that may not reflect yours. That's what, you know, so Mm -hmm. I don't know, that just kind of popped in my head about people were kind of putting their preconceived ideas. Cause yeah, like when you say a marathon, <laughs> I've never heard anyone say, I'm going to run a marathon, but like, Oh, just you wait. Let's see how that goes. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's like, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. 
So how did you choose your care team? Because if you're such the researcher, I know you are, and I know you put a lot of thought in, how did you find the midwife and doula that were best for you? Yeah, I started out with the doula because um, I, with my first birth, I was living in the city at the time and was um, at another midwife practice there, but it was at a big teaching hospital. They do a lot of research. So I had a good experience there, but I wanted something a little more calm. And now that I am out in the suburbs for this one, I was kind of starting from scratch. So I started with my finding my doula, which I found through a referral from a friend who had a great experience with her. And then I was able to talk to her just kind of an interview style. Like you you have to find the right fit. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really leaned on her to talk through the different providers that were available in my area, talk about my first birth and why I might want to go with one provider over the other based on what my goals were. Um, Because I think even when you get to interviewing your OB or your midwife, when you're looking for a new provider, they can like say one thing, but then if you have the firsthand experience from especially a doula who's probably been there for dozens and dozens of different births, Mm -hmm. um, they can give you a different perspective. So I really leaned on her and then when I met with my midwives, um, one thing that I noticed they did that maybe other care providers haven't done in the past, or just in general, when you're talking to anyone looking for the right fit, um, was instead of asking me, like, do you have any questions or any more questions? They would continually say, what other questions do you have? Okay. What's your next question? Like, so I never felt like I was being cut short on time or being rushed. Right. Um, and then coupling what they said, and then looking at the actual hospital stats. So the C-section rates, um, asking them questions about hospital policy and kind of walking through every single scenario um, possible. So I remember with one of the midwives, I was asking, um, how, how long do you give to push before you recommend, you know, an, a different type of birth? Um, is like, what's your time limit? And she was like, well, why are you concerned about that? You only pushed for 20 minutes in your first birth. I'm like, I just want to know every single possible scenario and and how it's going to be dealt with. So finding someone that took their time to go through that with me, even before I was like an actual patient, um, Mm. I knew I'd found the right, the right person to work with. Yeah. I think you hit on something like the patience and not trying to push you out. Cause I believe and these statistics might be old, but From years ago, I was told or looked up that it's on average seven minutes per appointment Mm. when you're pregnant because you're just in and out, you know, blood pressure, Mm. weight, peanut cup, whatever. Like, and then you're quick, you know, in and out, check, baby, good. And I love that they said, what other questions? Like it just opened up. We're here for you. And Mm -hmm. we really want to see you as an individual. Oh, that's so good. So, okay. We're going to take a quick break when we come back let's just hear your birth. Let's go for it. So we'll take a quick break and we're right back and hear Jessica's birth. Okay. We are back. So the floor is yours. I'm just curious how it all unfolded. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's the, the like headline of it was, it was very fast, but very peaceful. Um, and I feel really, really grateful that throughout the process, I felt very empowered and in control as one can be. So I guess, I think my birth story kind of starts at, at, at the end, um, around like 38 weeks. And for some context, my daughter came at 36 weeks. She was slightly premature with my first birth, um, but healthy and everything went really well. So with the second time around, I was trying to be prepared for that to happen again, um, again, making meals, getting nursery ready, just the basic things that you need for the first couple weeks to survive. Um, and was also trying to not expect the second birth to come that early either and, and hoping that they stay in longer for, um, for the health of the baby's sake. So um, at 38 weeks, I went into my first appointment where I did uh, let them t- or ask for a cervical check because I was getting really anxious. I'd been pregnant for two weeks longer than I had been the first time. And I was starting to get that feeling of like, okay, when's this going to be happening? I had been told that I had an irritable uterus, which I hadn't heard of in any of my research. But for me, basically the way that showed up was if I was standing up or not lying down, like I was having a Braxton Hicks contraction, my stomach was constantly tight. Um, I had a few false alarms thinking I was going into labor because of that. And also just I think I crossed the line of being in tune with my body and then second guessing like every single sensation because Mm -hmm. 
I was worried about going preterm again, but then also the added, um, st- not stress, but the added step with having a child already and making sure that she's taken care of and child care is in place before I go to the hospital. So mm-hmm. I was just mentally, again, yeah, exhausted <laughs> by that point. So I get to the 38 week appointment. They tell me I'm, I think three centimeters dilated, 70% of face. And then they asked basically like knowing that you had, um, a, a pretty fast birth the first time, is this something that makes you want to get induced? And I was starting to consider it at that point, just because of, again, those control factors of wanting to make sure my, my daughter was taken care of. And, um, my first birth was about three hours from contraction starting to her being born. So that's getting, quick. Yeah. Getting to the hospital on time the second time was something I wanted to make sure happened. Um, but I talked to my doula after that 38 week appointment and she kind of reminded me of uh, my goals and my principles of trusting my body, trusting its timing. Um, so I kind of went into a mantra for those last couple of weeks of I, I trust my baby, I trust my body, I trust their timing. That's something I said a lot. Um, And then so right at around the day before my due date, I had just had an appointment a couple days before my 39 weeks. And I was, again, four centimeters dilated, 80% of face, having all of these Braxton Hicks and um, really wanting this baby to just make its appearance. Um, And earlier that day, about 8 a.m., I did lose my mucus plug, which I thought had been happening for a few weeks. Um, But this definitely seemed like it this time. So again, not trying to expect it to come because every sensation I'd had in the weeks before made me question whether I was in labor or not. Um, but I took a little extra time that day to just try and relax, try and nap. Um, I actually did, I think one of Kathy's on-demand classes that day, trying to move the baby out as much as I could. Um, and was really, really tired because in that last week I was waking up at three o'clock every day. So I got to the end of that day, pretty exhausted, ready for a good night's sleep. Um, My husband and I had been up watching TV and I went up to go get ready for bed, brushed my teeth, washed my face. And I had been kind of complaining to him all evening about my stomach hurting. And I was blaming him for the tacos that he made. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, did you use a new spice? Like, are we sure the meat was good? My stomach's killing me. He's like, no, like, it's fine. Like, I feel fine. Like, Okay. So I go, yeah, again, I'm going to bed. And then I kind of had this weird feeling in my stomach where I was like, okay, I, I either my water just broke or like, I'm going to pass gas from the tacos. Like that's totally <laughs> went through my mind. And then I was like, oh, I think it was my water. So I, I tell my husband exactly that. I think my water just broke, which did happen with my first birth. So I was kind of surprised that it happened again. I know it doesn't happen every time, um, but I was, this is kind of what I was hoping for. Cause that was my like, but for sure. Okay. We need to go to the hospital now, even though like other contractions haven't picked up. Um, so he called our childcare to come over, watch my daughter. I called my doula and she was a little skeptical that it was my water breaking because it wasn't like the gush of water that like I experienced the first time and it didn't seem to be coming out very quickly. So she thought it was just more of my mucus plug, but I'm like, no, I, I felt it. Like I, I felt it in my gut. Like I, I know what this was. I've, I've been through it before. Um, so I laid down for a few minutes and then I stood up and more came out. So I was like, this is definitely the water. Like we're, we're going to the hospital right now. So she met us there. Um, water broke at like 10 30 PM. We got to the hospital by midnight and they confirmed it was my water. And by that point I did start having contractions that felt very different from the ones that I'd been having for the last few weeks. These were the actual like crampings, um, as opposed to just the tightening of my stomach. So um, my doula started timing them, but she said it was pretty hard to tell when I was having them. So I had to say like one starting now and now it stopped. So they were about five minutes apart when they moved me into the delivery room. And, uh, we were able to really set the stage and just have it be a peaceful process. So my doula turned off the lights. I got to turn on my labor playlist, um, which wasn't the case the first time when I gave birth, it was very chaotic. Things were happening very fast. Um, I felt like I didn't even have time to process what was really happening. And I had to do the continual monitoring that first time I was able to get up and move around. But this time, since I was full term, I was really happy to do the intermittent monitoring. But they had to do like, I don't know, 20 minutes of baseline testing, I think. So I had to lay in the bed for 20 minutes while they, they monitored the baby for 20 minutes. And I remember just being so uncomfortable and being like, I need to move. I need to get up. Like, when is this going to be over? Like, 
I, if I had to stay in the bed, I wasn't going to be able <laughs> to give birth medication. Did you birth. ask? Just curious. Cause one thing is that I had a conversation with, I think it was a childbirth educator that it's often said like, okay, we're going to expect you to lay down, but this is for listeners for, and not for obviously mm-hmm. Jessica, you've gone, gone through it, but for <laughs> listeners, you can push back and be like, oh, as long as we have the tracing, can I be up? Because doesn't it seem awful to be in active labor? And you were probably at that point at least five or six centimeters. You started oh, yeah. off at four. Mm-hmm. So to be on the, uh, like about to turn that corner into active labor and be like, lay down in this mm-hmm. small triage space, it just seems mean. So yeah. if you have another, <laughs> remember that. But for <laughs> listeners, you may be able to push back a little bit <laughs> if that's the case. So sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, there. that's great information to share with everybody. Because yeah, it was, it was intense. Um, and I remember when they left, it was really nice, the midwife, um, I think I was the only midwife patient there left that night. So again, it was a smaller community hospital, not tons of people in the middle of the city. So she just said, it looks like you have your support team here that you want. I'll be right outside the door. If you need anything, oh, grab so me nice. at any time. Yeah. She really gave us the space to like do our thing. Cause I think based on the times that I'd met with her, she kind of knew that I, I was that way and had a plan. Um, and then the nurse was amazing at coming in and checking on the baby every, I think it's like every 20 minutes they came in to take a, a short reading. And mm-hmm. no matter what position I was in, like she made herself completely unknown, like stuck the monitor, I don't know, wherever she needed to on my stomach and was in and out, like never bothered me. And I was so appreciative of that. Um, because it, yeah, again, it never stopped my flow. And then it was just for the next, I think, hour and a half, uh, me moving back and forth, my doula suggesting different positions. She's also a massage therapist, which was one of the things I loved about her when I found her. Um, so she was rubbing my back, putting heat packs on, kind of cha- cha- or trading spaces with my husband, um, allowing him to kind of be involved too. But um, yeah, it was it was really calm and relaxing. And I remember just kind of chatting with them um, again, listening to the music and then something I was mid sentence and just stopped and started to moan. It was like, I'd really turned the corner now into what was becoming transition. Um, and I, I couldn't talk after that. It was just getting on my hands and knees. I think I mumbled something to my husband, like get the list of things to say. And I was trying to get him to pull up on my phone, like the notes of all my, um, mantras and affirmations, but I couldn't remember that word at the time. So I'm like, just tell me what to say. Tell me what to say. He eventually figured it out and started kind of whispering those in my ear and found the right one that worked for me in, in whatever moment I was in. Um, and then I remember it getting really intense at one point and my body starting, starting to push, but I was a little bit in my head about it because with my first birth, she came out so quickly and I was purple pushing at the direction of my, my midwife at that time, instead of pushing with my body and listening to it. And I I tore a good amount with that first birth. So that was the only thing I was really nervous about in this time. And the thing I wanted to make sure that I was more in control of. Um, and because, uh, my water broke and they already knew I was dilated. I didn't have a cervical exam once I got to the hospital. So I really had no idea where I was at that point, but my body started, started to push. I started to feel the pressure and my doula was like, it's just your baby. Like, it, like breathe into the pressure. I was exhib- exhibiting all the symptoms with like the shaking and, um, yeah, knew it was about to be the end. And I started picturing in my head, like that feeling of having the baby in my arms but then was brought back into, into the present moment just by just being listening to them and having them say, like, if you want this to be over, we need to get the baby out. We need to start pushing. So I remember yelling also at one point, like, I need counter pressure, put a washcloth like down there. Like I need someone to support me. And they, they immediately did that. And I got into my preferred pushing position on my side. Um, and then yeah, my husband was very involved. He was like holding my left leg and I was telling him like, push my knee in, ankles out. Um, my, I'm just like, (laughs) I'm like, Oh my gosh, she knows so much. Yay. (laughs) Yeah. I was like very vocal and very communicative, even though I was, you know, in the thick of it. Internal rotation, (laughs) wide no sit bones, move the sacrum. I love it. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So I, I started to push once she confirmed, like, that I was at 10 centimeters and everything. And I think just having that like checklist of like, okay, it really is 
my body does know what to do. It wants me to push. I need to push. And I said, I think I said to my midwife, like, I don't want to tear. I don't want to do this like too fast. Like I want to breathe my body. And she's like, we will guide you do it with your breath. So I was able to do that. And, um, really just any time a contraction started coming, I told them and they helped support me physically. And I just breathed as it felt good. And then at whatever point, probably like 20 minutes into pushing, they had me reach down and feel the head. They're like, we're right there. Like, like gather all the strength you can, like these next few pushes are going to be it. Um, and I did get the head out (laughs) and instead of, it's just crazy to think like one that my husband can witness all this and to think that I was sitting there with like a head halfway out of my body. But then (laughs) my midwife was like, just relax. Like we're going to slowly ease it out. And I resisted, um, you know, like the mental push that I had to just like get it over as quickly as possible, knowing that like the slower and more methodical we did this, like the less likely I was to tear or do anything like that. So I just listened to the midwife at that point because she was the one kind of guiding me. Um, and then she said it was time to push the shoulders and I mustered all the strength I had. And then he, he kind of slid out at that point. And before I knew it, he was on my chest. And um, yeah, it was really, it was a beautiful moment at that point because we had in our birth plan, you know, wanted my husband to cut the cord and announce if it was a boy or a girl, but I got to see that it was a boy before anyone else. Cause he landed right on my chest. Um, and so I got to be the one to expl- exclaim, like, it's a boy. And I think I yelled just like, he's perfect. I love him. Like he's amazing. Um, oh, that's so and, beautiful. yeah, it was, it, it was, it was just everything, everything I could have wanted. And I got to have my, my golden hour. I don't know how they did it, but without him ever leaving my chest, like they took my gown off, they cleaned him up. Um, and, and yeah, it, I didn't even, I think we did the measurements. Yeah. After, after that first hour, um, and he ended up being eight pounds, 14 ounces, which was bigger than anyone expected. Um, one, because you did it, but your body opened. (laughs) It did. It did. And I, I think if I had known how big he was before then, and the funny thing is I, I had multiple growth ultrasounds throughout my pregnancy and something that gave me a lot of anxiety, um, with people's comments, um, was I'm I'm very tall and both my babies I've carried very low. So I never had like a huge bump. Um, and people would make comments like, Oh, you're measuring really small, both midwives as well as just like outsiders. Um, and it, it gave me anxiety that like, is my body not like giving the nourishment my baby needs? But I, I felt that it always was. And I was always annoyed when I had to do these growth ultrasounds. So the fact that he came out, yeah, almost nine pounds, <laughs> I was like, I told you so, like I felt it. So, um, oh, yeah, well, let's yeah, talk about that. Let's talk about the trust because <laughs> it sounds like you were able to give yourself to trusting and I'm just kind of spinning here because maybe I'm wrong, but I'm also a very type A personality and I like organizing. I like control. Um, So (laughs) kind of releasing that control and giving over to trust can be hard for someone that relates to that type A. And it sounds like you were well-prepared, well-researched. How did you give yourself over to trusting your body and just allowing this birth to flow? Because I know you had a plan. I know there are things in your mind, but something must have switched to be like, okay, I set the plan in place. Now I have to kind of just ride the wild river. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's kind of like, like yoga. Um, it's, it's called a practice. Like you, you practice these things every day so that when you need the tools, um, they, they just kind of show up and you don't need to think about it as much. So I think that's where a lot of that, um, like mental preparation throughout my pregnancy of doing those mantras about trusting my baby, trusting my body, um, doing the research and hearing other birth stories where other women did trust their bodies and had positive experiences. And even if a birth didn't go the way they planned, they trust that their body can recover. They have the tools to 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 gain their strength back and and do everything that that they want to do post birth. So um, I think it was again just a lot a lot of preparation and like not faking it till I make it. But the the more positively I think you talk to yourself, um, the the more positive experience you might have, or it just gets you in the right mindset to be able to deal with whatever comes your way. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think it's just a lot, a lot of work um, that's done done prior to that. Well, it sounds like you did a really, 
amazing thing. So what's one thing, one thing that you shared was that you were being very mindful to not compare your pregnancies and your birth to one another because your first one was very quick um, mm-hmm. and even your two experiences. So can you explain why that was important to you? Because I can imagine comparing, like you said, at week 36, you already gave birth. And so how did you do that and why was that important to you? Yeah, I, it was important to me because I, the first time I was pregnant, I didn't really have anyone else that was going through it with me. Um, I just had like people's past experiences or different stories I've heard to compare to, but this time I did have other friends that were going through it at the same time. And we were all having very different experiences. And, um, some things I would say to them is, you know, every pregnancy is different. Every birth is different. And, and every baby is different. I've learned with both of my babies, they're very different. And I've had to change some things, even though I I thought I knew how to do something one way with my son, it's just different. Um, So it was important for me to keep that in mind for myself. One, if it was um, advice I was sharing with friends, but also like to kind of keep things in check for myself mentally. And it was really tough near the end because I... I started to get scared, especially get, I think that 38 week mark for me was, um, starting to get a little bit stressful and where I keep having had to keep reminding myself of not doing these comparisons because I was like, well, if my pregnancy up to this point has been very similar, but now it's very different, I'm going to be pregnant a whole month longer than I was like what my head started spinning of like, what else is going to be different? Is the birth going to be worse than the first time? Is my postpartum period going to be more difficult? Like, is like just what it, it just started spinning out of control at that point. So I just had to keep reminding myself um, that th- that things are different. I don't know how they're going to be different. It could be different in a better way. And, and in this case, it, it was more peaceful. That was a, a big difference. Um, and so, yeah, it was just something I had to keep reminding myself because uh, if I didn't, then doubt started to creep in of whether I could do it again. Um, and things like that. So yeah, just really staying focused um, in the moment and meeting my body and this baby where it was, was something that I, I thought was important to keep reminding myself. So how was uniting your daughter with your new son? Had that oh my been? gosh. It was, it was amazing. amazing. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, I'm going to cry thinking about it. Um, she's just like the best big sister ever. And I think I also had a lot of um, guilt at the end of my, my second pregnancy, because, you know, I I only had one baby. She is my baby. Like, what am I going to do taking time away from her? Um, and how do I make room in my heart to love like another, another being as much as I love her, but it's like, they, like they said, um, or like, I've been told a lot at the end of the pregnancy that you, your heart just expands. You're not splitting up your love between two people. Like you're, your capacity for love just becomes even bigger than you ever imagined. So, um, when we got to introduce them, she immediately fell in love with him, was kissing him, reading him a book, wanted to hold him. Oh, that's um, so sweet. What's the age difference? Yeah. They're 21 months apart. So she was just approaching two and she understood the concept that like there was a belly and mama's baby and that there was a new baby coming. Um, and yeah, she's just been the greatest big sister. Anytime he cries, she's running around looking for his milk or pacifier or is shushing him and has her own little baby doll. She loves to mimic anything I do with him. So that uh, is so yeah. sweet. That <laughs> is really sweet. I heard when, when I was born, I guess my brother tried to sell me to the neighbor for a quarter. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. all I was worth. Just 25 cents back then. <laughs> So I'm glad it was smoother for you. We're going to take another break. When we come back, what is one final tip or piece of advice you'd like to share with new and expectant parents? We'll be right back. We're back. So I'm curious if you are going to be offering this tip or advice as a parent or as a prenatal yoga teacher. So (laughs) let's have it. What's your tip or piece of advice? Yeah, I, I think it's a mix of both because um, it's it's kind of twofold. But I think preparing for postpartum as much as you prefer, prepare for the birth is super important. And and that's when you're really in it. Um, and a part, as part of that preparation for postpartum, like I mentioned, I started seeing a PT when I was pregnant the first time, one, just to learn a little bit more about pushing and um, the work that the pelvis is doing and everything your body is going through. But then two, knowing that I'd already set up that support system and care provider after the birth had happened, no matter what type of birth I ended up with. So 
I think that's super, super important for people to consider if you have that um, availability or you, you have that ability to, to seek out a pelvic PT provider. And for the postpartum period, something that was super helpful for me was making a list of non-negotiables that helped me feel like myself or helped me um, to get, just take care of myself. So whether that was every morning I want to wake up and take a shower and brush my teeth and eat breakfast before um, I start I start my day caring for the baby, um, or I have to go on a walk once a day, even if it's just around the block, or I want to start reading a book that has nothing to do with parenting or um, postpartum or birth, like whatever it is, just having a, a little list of resources when you're in the thick of it postpartum. Um, and luckily I do have a really great support system that I was able to lean on and allow me to take, even if it was just a couple minutes a day to do the breath work from my PT or to do that reading or to just have, again, that time to take a shower where it's not a two minute super rush experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and yeah, just cause, cause that, that for me is, has always been the hardest part is that postpartum um, period. So preparing for that, just like you would, um, the birth, because it's, it's super important. And now you also have not just yourself to take care of, but a new baby as well. So I love that list of the non-negotiables. I think that's a really good takeaway for those listening is to think about that. You may want to have your list of non-negotiables for pregnancy, for Mm -hmm. birth and for postpartum, really highlighting your priorities that make you feel at home in this experience because it can be easy to feel a little bit overwhelmed and lost as especially in postpartum as you're now caring for someone else you can get a little lost of who you are so i love that you did that that's a really good takeaway thank you jessica i appreciate that so where can people find you when are you teaching again yeah um i am hopefully starting to teach soon i have one more month left on my maternity leave um so i teach at a studio called drip yoga in glen ellen illinois and, uh, you can reach out to me on Instagram too. JL Schwing underscore Roback is my handle. And I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with talking about all things, baby, birth, pregnancy, postpartum. Um, I just love to hear other people's experiences. So yeah, would love to just chat more with the community, but I really appreciate the community you have built Deb, and, um, the great resource that you have been for me during my pregnancy and hopefully be Thank able you. to take this to yeah more people going forward. I would love that. I loved having you in class. I mean, that was one of my favorite things about continuing our online is that you were still able to take, even when I was sitting on the yes. Upper side in New York City, <laughs> I would turn my little iPad on. I'm like, oh, Jessica's with us today. That's so nice. So I loved having you in the community. It was just a real pleasure to watch you go through your pregnancy. And thank you so much for sharing your story. I really appreciate you being open. And I think a positive birth story helps people see, like we were talking about those that said like, oh, you're not going to like, why would you do it? Let's paint a different picture of birth. So thank you for being part of that. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening.